Well, hey guys, and welcome to Mailbag, the Saturday edition here on Collider Video, the laid back, relaxed, informal, more behind the scenes, easygoing, relaxed version of movie talk, if you will, in many ways. My name is John Campia, and all we're going to do today is take your questions, and I'm joined once again by Perry Nemiroff. Perry, how you doing? Hey, guys. So happy to be back. I love doing this. It's good to have you back. And look, just a full disclosure here, we're recording this on Friday, and uh, she just found out her flight's been delayed by four and a half hours. <laughs> There's worse things in the world, especially when my iPad is filled with TV shows and movies I need to catch up on, so I have something to pass the time. Long flight, too. Oh, uh, yeah. To catch five flight. hours. <laughs> all right, guys. Like I said, this is a more relaxedly back kind of show you know the deal so we're gonna get started right now with question number one which comes to us from Charlie Gurinet and Charlie Gurinet writes the translations of Star Wars episode 8 title has just been unveiled in French uh, Les Diners Jedi and Spanish Los Ultimos Jedi on the official Twitter account of Star Wars so the title The Last Jedi is in the plural. What are your thoughts? Yeah, on Friday morning, my Twitter account just got flooded mm -hmm. with people from uh, like saying, oh, look, in, in the Spanish, it's plural. And then people, in the German, it's plural. Oh, look at this, in the French, it's like, everybody's writing it, yeah, 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 it's, it's in the plural. Um, and my reaction was, who cares? Who cares? I mean, look, I've, even if it, when we looked at the title of The Last Jedi, we knew, well, it could be plural, could be singular, whatever. If it's singular, all that means is at the beginning of the movie, you know, Luke Skywalker's The Last Jedi. Star Wars Episode Seven said Luke Skywalker was The Last mm -hmm. Jedi. But now he's got Rey. And Rey is clearly going to be training to be a Jedi. So it could have meant singular, just be talking about Luke. It could have been plural, talking about Luke and Rey. So it didn't really make any difference whether The Last Jedi was plural or singular. It is nice to know one way or the other, so there's no more mystery about it because in the other languages it is the plural Jedi. So clearly, I think clearly, they're talking about Luke and Rey when yeah. they are the last Jedi, but it could mean more. Like they could recruit five other Jedi in this or five other, you know, Padawans, whatever, in episode eight, and they are that together as a group, they still are the last Jedi. So, I mean, it doesn't really tell us anything. Were you surprised when you heard this? Or do you think there's any significance to this? I wouldn't say I was surprised just because we discussed this on an episode of Jedi that I was on and we just, you know, came up with ideas with whether it is singular or plural. Right. And both ideas and scenarios made a lot of sense to me. I am glad that I don't have to wonder between the two and now I can just speculate on the fact that it's plural, but I kind of lean towards the idea of maybe it being The Last Jedi in terms of maybe the end of the, the Jedi Order and we're going to get something new to take its place. Just without spoiling anything that's happening on Rebels right now, there's just a different kind of, uh, not necessarily force wielding, but I'm seeing like a different type of power come to rise that mm -hmm. I haven't seen before. And obviously Rebels takes place, you know, way in the past compared to what we're going to get in that bait. But just the idea of you know, maybe using the force or those kinds of tactics in a new way to get a rise out of a new organization that isn't the Jedi Order and something else. Kind of like, you know, we got uh, after uh, the Empire, then we get the, the, the First Order. Yeah, I mean, look, in the animated world, in the motion pictures, we've had one kind of force user, and that's either Jedi or Sith, I mean, in the two sides of that coin. In the animated world, we've become exposed to a lot of different types of force users, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, the, the sisterhood, the, the witches. Oh, the Night Sisters. Whether it's the Bendu, whether yeah. it's the Inquisitors. That, and all these are neither Sith mm -hmm. nor Jedi, so we're getting exposed to a lot of that. I'll say this, I was talking to a friend of mine, I was talking to Christian, and we were talking about, I mean, what if by the end of like episode eight or nine, like that's it, the Jedi are gone, and what if they, and the Sith are gone, and so we'll replace Jedi and Sith with something else. And that is certainly possible. And not only is it possible to happen, there are good things you can do with that as well. But I gotta admit, as, as an old school Star Wars fan, mm. I hate the idea, at least in advance, I hate the idea of Star Wars without Jedi. That it just, that doesn't feel right to me. And that, that's not to say they couldn't do it and then introduce something different mm -hmm. that's even better? Absolutely could. I'm just saying initially in advance, my feelings get kind of thinking, oh, I you get can't that. have Star Wars without Jedi and Sith, are you crazy? It's the first idea that crossed my mind when I started to think of this scenario possibly playing out. The only thing that gives me hope though is that I've seen those kinds of transitions happen in the books in particular. Mm -hmm. 
you know, especially with bloodline and what's discussed in that yeah. and seeing the change of hands with powers and factions and all that, I feel like there could, I, I don't want a Star Wars film franchise without Jedi at this point. How, and it will be a challenge to justify it. However, I do really think that they might be able to pull it off, like pass the torch in a way that embodies what we know and love of the Jedi from past films while creating something new that we could potentially get really into and really excited about and feel fresh for all the new characters we're gonna meet going forward. So I'm staying hopeful. I'm just excited that you know The Last Jedi is a title that we could discuss. It doesn't yeah. spoil anything, but it really does give us something concrete to speculate on until we get a trailer. Well, I want to know what you guys think. Jump into the comment section. Let us know this. Here's my question for you. Do you think, now knowing that the title of The Last Jedi is actually in the plural, do you think this gives us any hints or any indication about whether by the end of this trilogy there are still going to be any Jedi around or not? I'd like to know what you guys think because I'm stressing out about it just a little bit. So let us know. All right. The next question today comes to us from Christopher Cadwell Jacques, who writes, Hey guys, you're my favorite thing on YouTube. Keep up the great movie talk. Well, thank you so much. With Streep Monster getting her 20th, <laughs> that's Meryl Streep, by the way. With Streep Monster getting her 20th Oscar nod in her incredible career for Florence Foster Jenkins, which was not a Best Picture nomination, I looked out of curiosity. Only three of those 20 nominations that Meryl Streep have have come from a Best Picture nominee including 0 out of 5 since they expanded the list. There certainly can be great performances in so-so movies, but on average, I feel great performance elevates movies. What is the pattern here? Why haven't 17 of her other Oscar-level performances done this? Um, you know what? It's, it's a fair question to ask um, about that, but here's the thing. I think people often confuse great movies with great performances and per confuse great performances with great movies. And it's, it is an interesting t statistic. It's saying out of 20 of Streep's uh, Academy Award nominations, only three have been pictures that have been best picture eligible or, or nominated. So the question is, um, why, if she's so good, why doesn't she elevate that movie to best picture uh, contention? And the answer is really, because she doesn't write the script. No matter how good a performance is in a role, if the bones aren't there, if the bones aren't there, then it doesn't matter how good one single performance is. Now, you could look at something like this year, Manchester by the Sea, mm -hmm. which I think is a good movie, but personally, I don't think it deserved a Best Picture nomination, although it's a very good movie. But that wasn't just one incredible performance with uh, Casey Affleck, yeah. that movie is heavily populated. First of all, it's a very good movie just to start. Then you fill it and populate it with incredible performances across the board, and together they raise it. On the other hand, you can take a movie that came out the other year that Meryl Streep was not nominated for, Ricky and mm -hmm. the Flash. Yeah, like two years ago, oh. written by Academy Award winning writer, um, uh, oh, she wrote, uh, she wrote Juno, and she wrote uh, Diablo, Diablo Cody, Cody. Jonathan you. Demi directed. She had come in when she was in her office, and written by them. Not a great movie. Not was, a great movie. It was awful. Not a good, not a good movie. I didn't hate it, but I'm, I'm not going to say uh. it was terrible. But Meryl Streep in it? I honestly, I thought you could have made an argument that you could have nominated her for that movie too. I thought she she learned how to play guitar in that for that movie. She never knew how to play guitar before. I mean. I thought she was incredible, but that's a great example of having a movie that is not up to snuff, regardless of who, have, who, who you put in it, then you put in the, an actor, and the actor turns in a hell of a performance that, for me, made that movie at least watchable, but it's not going to elevate it. So I think it has more to say about the films that Streep has been in. If anything, I think it highlights just how good Meryl Streep is, considering she's getting these nominations for films that aren't good enough on their own mm -hmm. to be nominated for Best Picture. So I don't know, you're looking at this. It is an interesting question. It How is. do you interpret it? It's an interesting thing to consider. I don't know if I would go that far with Ricky and the Flash. That but is watchable? Yeah, well, <laughs> but I mean, truth be told, she, she's the street monster for yeah. a reason. I don't think I've ever in my life seen a single movie with Meryl Streep in it that made me think, you know, eh, she was okay. She not mailed that this great. one in. But, I mean, you like not not way. even stooping that low. I've n I don't think I've ever thought in my life, oh, she was all right. Like yes. she was, she just filled the role as necessary. No, she 
pretty much has always elevated a role or elevated a movie in my mind. Florence Foster Jenkins, I mean, that that movie was her movie. It oh, most certainly is her. not a best picture movie. And, you know, if I were the one choosing the five Academy Award nominees, I don't know if I would have thought to choose her, but what you bring up is, is kind of spot on. Clearly, she made enough of an impression in that movie that she deserved that nomination from her peers. I don't know if that's gonna pan out for her in the actual ceremony. Odds are it's not, but she definitely deserved it. And looking at that list now, because when they first announced the nominees, I was thinking, oh, take her out and put Amy Adams in her, in her place. Then I saw Elle and um, Isabel Huppert is is fantastic in that movie. I did not like that movie. It's not a bad movie. Mm. It most certainly did not suit my taste whatsoever, and I don't know if they really justified the mystery they presented, but I did not enjoy that movie to such an extent that now I'd rather swap Amy Adams into her spot instead. But. You know, the, basically this question for Meryl Streep in particular just speaks to how incredible she is, that no matter what she's in, you are going to look at her and you are going to wonder in your mind, should she be nominated for an Oscar? Because that's why this happens here. Yeah, and that's funny. That's the level she's at. We don't look at her for and say, will they be good in it? Our first question is, will she? It's like her yeah. and Dana Day-Lewis. Are they going to win yeah. best, best Actor? Another great example of just, you can't equate the quality of the movie with the quality of the performances in it. Because let's look at the movie that is currently, no film in history has ever won more Academy Awards mm. than The Lord of the Rings Return of the King. It was nominated for 11 Academy Awards and it swept and won all 11 Academy Awards, including Best Picture. But out of all those Academy Awards, you know what it didn't get nominated for? Any of the actors. Mm -hmm. None of the actors got nominated for any of the acting categories in that. So you can't necessarily say that, well, if a performance is great, that means it's a Best Picture nom. Or if a Best Picture gets nominated, that means the performances should be nominated for Best Actor. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily work that way. It often does work that way, but it doesn't necessarily work that way. All right, let's move on to the next question. And this one comes from Andrea Wisconoli. Uh, I can't tell if that's Russian or Italian. Uh, Andrea Wisconoli, who writes, Question about the Affleck wanting to leave Batman situation. Why did every news outlet in the world run with your story? And if you didn't want them to run with it, why did you talk about it in the first place? Love what you guys do, bring on the filthy. Um, yeah, so you were the first one to mention to me. Yeah, uh, John, yeah. somebody's quoting you. <laughs> I knew it was gonna happen. <sighs> I knew it. I Okay, here's the thing. I thought it would happen with some really unreliable, uh, uh, no good reputation mm -hmm. kind of, I can think of a couple I thought would have run with it, but I did not think so many people would run with it. Look, yeah. here's the thing, so to those you don't know, um, so this week made a little bit of a stir on Movie Talk because I had had over the past weekend a, a number of conversations with people who are one way or another uh, through the orbits are connected to what's going on over at WB. And, you know, Ben Affleck left as director. Uh, what I got told in no uncertain terms is that Ben Affleck actually wants out of being Batman. He doesn't just want out as being the director, he wants out of being Batman. Um, I then, with Christian Harloff standing right beside my phone rings, I get a call from another source saying, not only does he want out, the feeling is mutual that Warner Brothers doesn't want him to be Batman anymore either, but they're kind of stuck in this situation where, from a PR point of view, uh, first of all, there's a contractual problem. Ben can't just get up and walk because he's contractually obligated. Warner Brothers can't just let him get up and walk because there's a PR perspective to, to have here, and, and all this kind of stuff. However, before I revealed that stuff on Movie Talk, I went into like, it felt like a four minute disclaimer. <laughs> like four minutes, because I wanted to be sure to that everybody was perfectly clear that we here at Movie Talk do not break scoops. I do not break scoops. I never try to break scoops. None of that nonsense. Didn't want it to be a scoop, and I even explicitly said, do not run with this. I cannot verify the validity of what these people are telling me. I trust them, I believe it, but from a reporter point of view, and I ain't no reporter, I'm a pundit. 
Uh, so I want to give this, I give this huge, long disclaimer. So don't run with this. As far as you're concerned, you shouldn't consider this reliable. I'm just telling you this. Now, you have to understand that before we started Movie Talk, this is going back all the way to back when I used to do the movie blog. I was very um, committed to the idea of this, and I would say this to my readers all the time, and I'd say it on my podcast all the time. I am not a news site. I'm a pundit, and I'm a commentator. I'm just a fan who likes to talk about what's going on in the news. And that means my blog at the time was the movie blog, is going to be about my thoughts, my opinions, and my experiences. And I'm going to sh just openly talk about those things, my thoughts, my opinions, and my experiences, and what I have. And that in an environment that amongst friends, that being my readers, my listeners, and my co-hosts, co amongst friends, we can just talk about what's going on, and that's the level. Be clear, we're not scoopers, we're not reporters, we're not, none of that kind of stuff. And we're just going to talk about what's going on. And we brought that philosophy when Dennis and I got like uh, For Your Consideration going, then ultimately when I brought it over to AMC and we started Movie Talk, which is now here at Collider, I've always wanted to maintain that, that Movie Talk is about a group of friends just talking about their thoughts, opinions, and experiences here in this world of movies. And I don't feel this is my opinion, and maybe I'm wrong, and maybe you feel I'm incorrect on this, but my feeling is this. I should not have to be censored out of the fear that other news outlets will act inappropriately. I should not have to censor myself out of the fear that other news organizations or news outlets or, or YouTube channels or podcasts or whatever will act inappropriately with what I say. When somebody who is not a studio executive, who is not a director in, in, the, in Warner Brothers, says, look, I had this experience, but before I share it with you, know this. I cannot validify or verify the validity of what they're saying. Don't run with this as a story. This isn't a scoop. You'll notice that everybody out there ran a story on Bat Ben Affleck once out of Batman except Collider Video. We did not put up a video about this. We had it tucked into a conversation about Matt Reeves instead. I shouldn't, nor you, nor Dennis, nor Christian, nor Mark, nor Schnepp, nor Jeremy, should have to censor what we say. We should qualify it if we need to. We should not have to censor ourselves in openly, as friends, discussing what's going on in the movie world, what we've heard, what we think is true, what we don't think is true, and all that kind of stuff, out of the fear that somebody else will inappropriately take with it and make a headline out of it to try to be clickbait. So that was the starting thing. And it, it's, it's a horrible thing, but then I would have some people write to me and say, well, John, if you didn't want people to share it, you shouldn't have said it. Th to me, that's like a pack of asshole dudes who assault a girl saying, if she didn't want to be assaulted, she shouldn't have dressed so sexy. That's ridiculous, okay? That's stupid thinking. Uh, and I, I dismiss that and reject that form of logic completely. I think if somebody gets on a podcast, I'm a... I am not a student. I'm a fucking nobody. I'm a dude who does a YouTube channel, okay? And I, I give like a four minute long disclaimer. Now, do I believe it? Absolutely, I believe it. I believe 100% in it that it's true, but I can't verify that to you, so you shouldn't have run with it as a story. I mean, that's not the story. And I'm, I'm honestly, I'm really, I'm disappointed in our online space, that so many sites that I respect a lot and all that kind of crap would take this and run. And a lot of them would say, now John Campy of, of uh, Movie Talk said, take with a grain of salt. I didn't just say take with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. I noticed that none of you quoted, John Campy also said, do not run with this as a story. Um, none of them said that. So I, I'll be honest with you, I'm a little bit disappointed with how the online, our online space handled it. Um, it should, nothing that comes from my mouth because I'm just a dude doing a YouTube channel. Nothing that comes from my mouth should be a headline story somewhere. Unless I say to you, I just had lunch with Ben Affleck hmm. and he told me this. Then that's understandable. Otherwise, no, but you've been sitting very close to all I, this and yeah. watching all this kind of stuff happen. It's, it's weird watching something like this happen, having a background of being on the dot-com side for so long and just experiencing the process of, you know, oh, we hear this story, it's not a story that was confirmed by a studio, do we cover it or do we not? And I'm very lucky to have worked most of my professional career in this industry with Adam Chitwood and Matt Goldberg and Steve Weintraub where they've always been very diligent. You know, if something is completely untrue, they don't run with it. However, I've also worked for other sites that, 
you know, I wouldn't say take the opposite approach, but at the same time, it's a business and it's competitive. And when your competitor runs with that headline regardless and they get all the clicks, I do understand the mentality of them saying, well, if they're running with it, we need to run and compete so we don't lose our business too. But at the same time, the one part of this that I really do find inexcusable is when someone writes up an article like this and does not put your disclaimer in it. That, yeah. that to me is inappropriate journalism. If you say something like that, with that much of a story to preface it about how you don't know if this is true because you know there's something to be said with running what you had said on the show and then you know putting it up as a discussion topic you know let, like let's let's take what what he he has heard has happened whether or not he's 100 percent verified on it or or like you did on the show said over and over i the, I cannot confirm this, don't run with it. One way or the other, putting it up as a discussion topic. Like, you know, a lot has been going on with the DCEU at this point. That seems like a more fair way to approach it, I guess. But that, that is just the culture we're in right now. It's just all you need someone is to tweet like the wrong two words, if anything, or, or tweet the wrong picture with the wrong hashtag or have a celebrity out there you know, post a picture of themselves with a certain hairdo and a, you know, a comic that inspired it and we're all screwed and caught up in a rumor mill that spirals out of control. It's, you know, it's unfortunate to a degree, but I try to always look at the flip side of it, which is, I mean, isn't it cool that people freak out over a Batman movie and freak out over years and years of Star Wars? So that's my silver lining here. Yeah, I just and look, this it's totally fine to you know like we on Collider Movie Talk, we will run with the store with reports that like say the Hollywood Reporter writes or that Screen Rant writes mm -hmm. or whatever. If they themselves say we believe this can be a report and they put it up themselves, we didn't even do that. I mean, it, we and we said please don't run with this. This is not. This is just us talking. This is just us talking. It's talking about some things we heard and whatever and. I, I was just a little discouraged by it, and, and yeah, you know, I'm going to mark this up to a learning lesson for yeah. me. Uh, I, I still, by the way, I'm, I'm, I am 100% standing. I do believe that stuff. I, I believe 100% of it. I believe we're going to get some kind of a press release saying Ben loves being Batman, and then after Justice League releases, then we'll hear about some other things. That's I how, what I believe. I would not be surprised myself. And you know, kind of tagged onto that, uh, as I mentioned, uh, full disclaimer, we're recording this on Friday. We just uh, finished shooting a couple things in there, and as uh -huh. we were shooting something over there, news broke that this is not in the mailbag, but we'd be remiss if we didn't bring this up. Oh, yeah. Um, that a lot of people, including myself, felt a little bit better about the situation at Warner Brothers in DC when it's like, you know what, Ben Affleck, I think one of the best filmmakers going around today, our best Batman that we've had on film to date, he's off, but you know what? They got, looks like they got Matt Reeves. Looks like they got Matt Reeves. Okay, I mean, I, I don't think that's quite as good as having Ben Affleck direct it, but that's a pretty damn good replacement. And as we're recording in the studio, mm. we all get the notifications on our phones. Talks between Warner Brothers and Matt Reeves have broken down. Uh, and I believe the wording in the oh, article the wording is, is awful. Uh, maybe they'll get back together once their heads have cooled. Yeah. So this wasn't just some minor little thing that The Hollywood Reporter is putting out there. I don't know. It's getting to the point that when I hear Warner Brothers DC films, all I can hear in my head is the Benny Hill music. I just and look, let's be clear here. They're not saying the, the negotiations are. Well, maybe they are, but it's not done. This could still work out. Matt Reeves may still end up being the director of of Batman, but it's just on its own. We probably wouldn't think too much of this. But in the midst of all the other drama yeah. with, with the Warner Brothers DC oh. properties, it's kind of, you can forgive us if we just roll our eyes and go, here we go again. I don't know, you heard about this, when did oh, you think? Oh, this killed me. When I heard about it, I wouldn't say I was surprised. I was very excited about the idea of Matt Reeves directing this movie. It, it gave me, as much as I was upset about what's going on there and with Ben Affleck stepping down as director, if I could be close to that excited had the project moved along as planned, it would be with Matt Reeves in the director's chair. He's one of the directors out there that could have come as close to Ben Affleck as giving me a lot of confidence in this movie. 
This news was upsetting. Then again, when Matt Reeves was announced to be in talks to direct it, like that's just the nature of negotiations. Mm -hmm. They could break down, and the fact that they broke down isn't surprising to me. Uh, and this could just be a poor choice of words, but this sentence just, the sentence is like breaking my heart a little bit Why and then ripping it, it apart. Because this is from, so, um, uh, this is from uh, Hollywood Reporter. Hollywood Party and Kit wrote uh, this, right? Boris? Um, we have. I believe uh, Boris wrote this. Yeah, Boris Mia, Kit wrote this. Yeah, Boris Kit with Mia Galupo. Right. And, um, and Boris is a guy I've been reading for a long, long time. Yeah. He's, he's great. As, as have I. The, the two sentences here are A studio source confirms that negotiations have broken down. All right, that's fine. Then, the possibility, however, exists that talks could resume when heads cool. <laughs> uh, maybe whoever chose those words does not quite understand what heads cool could you know infer but to me that suggests that they were fighting over this negotiations yeah. they could not come to an agreement and people walked away not very happy and that that is alarming it's a little alarming i i don't want to get too out of control and say oh my god sound the alarms everything is imploding but th that's potentially a, v a very poor choice of wording or the completely uh, accurate <laughs> no. so wording look a couple of things to keep in mind there though number one they have not said that Warner Brothers has moved on from Matt Reeves mm -hmm. okay let's keep that in line and while I will roll my eyes and we all we will all say here we go again if these negotiations do completely fall apart and Matt Reeves moves on and Warner Brothers moves on and we'll all have our moment of going here we go again that doesn't mean they couldn't go out and get another mm -hmm. great director. Fede Alvarez yeah. is, a, is a name that's been on their list. So, look, they also met Damon. Scott. Ridley Scott is the guy that they've been talking about. I don't know if I necessarily want a Ridley I, Scott one, but... I want to see the new Alien first before I... Because Very I had given call. up on Ridley Scott before yeah. uh, the, the Martian. Yeah. Once the, I, I t totally... But he'd gone, like, seven years without putting out anything mm -hmm. good. But then the Martian game is like, Ridley Scott's back, baby. And then the trailer for Alien came. Oh, it's it like, looks good. This looks so good. But it just came out like, yeah, it sucks that Ben Affleck left. If negotiations would get completely destroyed with Matt Reeves, yeah, it'll suck because we all kind of felt like this was about to happen. That We all felt it was kind of a done deal. We felt oh, yeah. like, even though they hadn't said it was a done deal, I think fans and ourselves, we kind of felt like it was a done deal. So losing Matt Reeves would suck. And we would, kind of, we'll make jokes about it and we'll do all that kind of stuff, I'm sure. But the reality is that even if that happens, they could get another good director or Matt May sign. And this, all this worry may be for nothing. It's just, it, why does it always seem to happen with Warner Brothers in DC? Just to speculate if the head's cool thing isn't legit, Reeves is in post-production on Apes. He's busy. That busy franchise is doing pretty damn well. For all we know, the execs at that studio are looking at what he's cutting and they're saying, man, this is great. We want to, uh, uh, oh God, now I'm going to start a rumor, but just to speculate, maybe they are very happy and they want him to do more work in the Apes franchise. Yeah. I don't know. I Who don't know. Who knows, but it does, I mean, Boris is not yeah. one to write. Uh. All right, <laughs> let's move on. We're actually going to fire through, We've, we're almost at a half hour already, so we're going to rip through a couple of questions here really quickly, okay? Ben Holmes writes, Favorite Morgan Freeman film and performance? Mine is Shawshank Redemption. What's yours? Mine is Shawshank, Shawshank Redemption, but just to throw out another title that I'm oddly obsessed with, it is Deep Impact. Not necessarily because of his performance, but I just love that we movie. We will go on. <laughs> yeah, where he's played the president. Uh, mine, uh, like yours, Ben, is also Shawshank Redemption, because it's also one of my favorite films of all time. But uh, he was great. Where, where he really became a household name was Driving Miss Daisy. Oh, yeah. And, of course, I believe he won the Academy Award for... Um, uh, the, 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 with the boxer, um, oh. baby, something baby, uh, uh, cry baby. I can't. Thank you, million, million dollar, dollar baby. baby. Thank you, fact checker Jonathan over there. Yeah. Uh, million dollar baby. He was great in that mm -hmm. one Academy Award for that, but for me, it's Shawshank Redemption. All right, next question comes from Will Swordstorm, who writes: A lot of speculation on the next Transformers movie, <laughs> but what would your ideal Transformers film look like? Look, for me, it's simple: focus on the Autobots and Decepticons on Earth, make a really tenacious, awful relationship between Megatron and Starscream, have a great noble Optimus Prime, and focus on them without a lot of the humans, and even have, an have them fighting over Energon. Do get back to some of the core elements 
of the things that made the cartoon special. Don't do a direct translation of the cartoon. That wouldn't work. But get back to some of those core elements, and I think it can work. But what, what do you think they need to do? My ideal Transformers is even simpler. Just a black screen and nothing. I don't want any more Transformers <laughs> and movies. And that, ladies and gentlemen, would be a better film <laughs> than the last Transformers movie. Quite possibly, yeah. All right. Uh, Niall Hassett writes, uh, so you heard of this film, Logan, hmm. a small indie film that looks to have been pretty good. You've seen it yet. Yep, uh, we saw it. We, yes, we did. Uh, we dropped our review of that. This, you're seeing this on Saturday, so we dropped our review of this yesterday. Mm -hmm. Why don't you sum up what you thought about Logan? This so far exceeded my expectations. I didn't realize how much I needed and wanted an R-rated Wolverine movie. I needed this movie. I needed to see Wolverine fight like that. I needed to see Laura X-23 fight like that. It is so well done, feels so different. It's so atmospheric. It has such great relationships. There's too many good things to say. Just go watch our review. The movie's magnificent. It's everything I had hoped it would be and more. I mean, and it truly is. I have mentioned this in the review, but you, know, you hear the saying, I laughed, I cried. No, this mm -hmm. movie has it all. There are deep, connective, emotional moments throughout the film that you will find your heart beating in your chest about. There are some extremely funny moments. The action might be some of the oh. best action ever in a comic book movie. It's gritty and grim and yet but uplifting at moments as, as well. It was capped off by insanely good performances mm -hmm. by Hugh Jackman, by Patrick Stewart, and by the little girl playing X-23. Daphne Keene, I remembered. Oh wow. my God, I mean, honestly, if she doesn't get the performance she gives, maybe the movie doesn't work as well. Oh, no way. She's incredible, you believe this girl. Like the entire movie, you believe it. So yeah, go check out our review. We, do, we have a half hour review up, go check that out. But obviously we highly recommend Buy your advance tickets for Logan because the movie mm -hmm. is well worth it. All right, Ted Fox writes, over or under 50% <laughs> that Mel Gibson actually directs Suicide Squad 2. Oh, boy. What do you think? Oh boy, ah. Oh. I don't know, I think I might go over at this point. I feel like DC and Warner Brothers might be pushing for a name on his level, especially given what's going on. Oh my God, yeah. They, they might be willing to forego contractual obligations they would have with, a, with an unknown, not necessarily an unknown, but someone who is not of Mel Gibson status in order to say Mel Gibson is directing Suicide Squad 2. And I think I've thought about it long enough that I'm at a point where I kind of want it to happen. I know I want it to happen. From just as somebody who appreciated Suicide Squad, and I, I but I know I want it to be mm -hmm. a lot better. Um, Mel Gibson, look, can bring that. When you, Apocalypto, I think, is one of the best directed films, purely directed films, of the last a long time. Uh, Braveheart is one of a lot of people's all-time favorite mm -hmm. movies. Um, Hacksaw Ridge was my personal favorite film of 2016. I think it should win Best Picture. It won't, but I believe it should. And I believe Mel Gibson should win Best Director for that. What he did in that, here's the insane thing he did. I've mentioned this before. You have two opposing philosophies in this movie. One is that we need violence and we need war to protect the things we know and love. On the other hand, you have the protagonist of the film who's like, no, I, I cannot take a life. I do not believe in violence. I'm not going to do that at all. And you think in that scenario, a lesser director would have come in and made one side the hero side and one side the villain side. Hmm. Instead, he totally shows the validation of both of those philosophies and you know, shows heroes from both of those philosophies. And in the end, how one guy made his philosophy work with the philosophy of the people he was trying to save at the same time. It's insane how he did that. And uh, I want to do it. But on the over-under, will he? I'm going to take the under on it. Um, I still think there's a good chance to do it, but I'll take the under 50% because Mel Gibson is notorious. If I'm in the director's chair, I call the shots. And I don't know that Warner Brothers is going to be willing to let him hmm. do that. Maybe they will. He's, he explained it as Warner Brothers and him have just had a first date on talking about Suicide Squad 2. So we're not very far along. They're not in heavy negotiations. I think they would like him to do it. I think he would like to do it. And you know, here's the funny thing though. A lot of people have pointed this out to me on Twitter is that, you know, not that long ago, Mel Gibson got on Twitter, and I might be paraphrasing a little bit, but he did use the words that Batman versus Superman is a piece of shit. And it's like, well then, that. well then how can he direct that? <laughs> Maybe then that's the guy. Like, look, I like Batman v Superman, but a lot of people feel a bit the way about it that Mel Gibson does. Maybe then that's the guy you should be bringing in. 
to do something completely different than what they've done. I, I mean, it's funny I don't the way know. you describe Hacksaw Ridge. If you take that and apply it to Suicide Squad, it could make it better. Just the mentality of mm. believing in one approach to winning a war, let's right. say, let's just call their their battle that, but having to meld it with others, it actually kind of does make sense. And what Mel Gibson does with the with the film, it's you know, it's Andrew Garfield's movie. Yeah. But he does a pretty damn good job of highlighting the ensemble too. There's a couple characters in that movie that that stand out big time for a movie that is designed to be entirely about Andrew Garfield. Well, I mean, uh, why am I forgetting his name? Dodgeball Boy. Uh, Dodgeball Boy. The, the lead guy in Dodgeball. Oh, Vince Vaughn? Uh, Vince Vaughn. He's great. Surprising. He's so good. If you haven't seen Hacksaw Ridge yet and you saw Vince Vaughn in this, come up. No, no, no. He's great in the movie. He's really, mm -hmm. really good. All right. Uh, we're almost out of time, so I'm going to go with the last question of the day. Pardon me. Efren Guzman writes Hey, John and Perry. What film would you like to see? I get this question asked mm. a lot, actually. What what sequel would you like to see that you feel needs a sequel? What sequel to a film do you need to see that needs a sequel? Uh, that's all I have. Have a good week. Uh, I always have the same answer for this, but I want to know yours. Well, if I went with my same answer, it would be another Lego movie that is oh. Friday the 13th. I've said this a million times. So, a Lego so, Friday the okay, 13th? So, so someone, when we were talking about Lego movies, someone brought it up. It was like on Twitter or something during Mailbag or they tweeted at me. I don't know what it was, but they said, because uh, because Friday the 13th is in a position where the revite, rights could revert back to New Line, which is owned by Warner, which is under the Warner Brothers umbrella. Right. So if that happens, potentially the best possible scenario of getting another Friday the 13th movie could be doing it in Legos, and then think about what happens at the end of Lego Batman where other things away. happen. That idea blows my mind. I want to see it happen. I want to see what Lego blood looks like. I think it would be a brilliant way to Lego expand the franchise. Like. But to have another answer that people haven't heard 500 times at this point, I want the continuation of the Final Destination franchise. When wow. Final Destination 5 came out, there was a rumor that they would do 6, and there was, I don't know if it was a fake trailer or whatnot, but the trailer was for Final Destination The Dark Ages. And way in the past, how cool would it be to see a Final Destination movie set in the past? Final Destination 5 was actually the first Final Destination film I enjoyed. It, I, and, and it was ooh, the last one good. they did. Yeah, it's, I liked it. I, I, I love them all, except four. Okay. Four drives me off my mind. Um, uh, to me, it's always the same answer. Mystery Men. Mystery, oh. Men, Mystery Men is a film <laughs> that was so far ahead of its time. And if I just think it's time to revisit, because uh, William H. Macy, uh, of course, Ben Stiller, Jeannie Garofalo. Oh, wow, um, I did not expect you to go here. Oh, my God, Paul Rubin. Uh, oh, who played the Blue Raja again? He does all the voice oh. of the Simpsons. Hank Azaria, thank you. Tough beast. Um, yeah. <laughs> Hank Azaria. I mean, the shoveler, the Blue mm -hmm. Raja, the bowler, Mr. Furious. Oh, wow. I mean, this movie, I love this movie so much. <laughs> I love Mystery Men so much. And like, no matter what Jeffrey Rush has gone on to do in his life, to me, he will always be Casanova Frankenstein. <laughs> Uh, and Captain Amazing, wow. anybody? Captain Amazing, one of the greatest characters in any superhero film ever. Um, <laughs> I want to see a sequel to that one so bad. I haven't watched it in a very long time, but I did go through a phase right when it had come out, and I, I was pretty young then where I would just watch it over and over mm. and over again. It makes me want to rewatch it now. Well, all right, guys, that'll do it for us. We've run out of time on this episode of Mailbag. Thanks for joining us. Don't forget, we'll be back again tomorrow for our Sunday edition. And uh, yeah, full disclosure, we're going to record it right now. <laughs> but uh, the Sunday edition will be back up again tomorrow. Hopefully, we'll get through a lot more questions than we did today. We had a couple of big ones to address. Perry, where can people find you online? You guys can catch me on Twitter and Instagram at PNemroff. And also later today, Collider Behind the Scenes, which is a good one. It's, you've done such a great job with Thank that you. show so far. I, I love it. I love watching so it. So much fun. All the time. If you have an, it's a brand new show. We've only had three episodes so far. Uh, this would be, this week's would be the fourth, our fourth. Yeah. Our fourth, yeah. Fourth one's coming out. If you haven't had a chance to check out the Behind the Scenes and Bloopers show that comes out on the weekends, check it out. It's really fun. And this week's is really, oh, really yeah. fun. It's really cool. Uh, you guys can follow me on Facebook and Twitter, simply at John Campia. That'll do it for this episode. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you like our programming, make sure you tweet about it. Take it, tweet out the show, tweet out the link, put it on your Facebook page, whatever you'd like. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks for watching. Join us, and we'll see you tomorrow.